Um, I first discovered Bitcoin in uh, 2010. I heard about it. I thought, nerd money, sounds funny. And then I ignored it for another six months. And then I rediscovered Bitcoin in 2011. And that time I decided to read the Satoshi paper. Uh, my background is in security and distributed systems. So I wanted to read the actual science behind it and try to understand it from a technical perspective. So I started reading the Satoshi paper. If you haven't read it, um, you should definitely read it. It's nine pages. It's one of the most uh, brilliant pieces of science writing. Uh, every single word in that paper means something. Satoshi was able to predict uh, several things that took years to unfold in Bitcoin. And, uh, and just outlined every aspect of the currency in just nine pages, which is incredible. I mean, it would have taken me a hundred pages to say the same things. So uh, read that paper. Um, when I started reading that paper, uh, a little light bulb went off in my head. Uh, light bulb, supernova-sized light bulb, and uh, and it just completely overwhelmed me because uh, immediately I realized this is not a currency. Uh, it's not a currency, it's a network, it's a platform, it's an invention. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that, the possibilities just started unfolding in my mind. And I went into a state of fugue that's happened to me four times before in my career. First computer I had, the first internet connection, the first website I visited, the first time I downloaded Linux. All of those were just uh, revelatory experiences for me. And, and they put me in a state of obsession. I wanted to learn everything about these technologies. And, and for a long time, um, you know, during the uh, I guess 98 to 2010 period, I didn't see anything else that really excited me as much. And then Bitcoin just hit me in the face like a sledgehammer. And so I spent the next uh, six months obsessively consuming and writing and coding and reading everything I could about Bitcoin until I lost so much weight that my family staged the mini intervention because uh, <laughs> I had stopped eating from from the obsession. Yeah, not a healthy way to do it. I have a better balance now. But uh, that's the kind of impact that Bitcoin had on me, because it, 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 it was something that aligned my interests and my, uh, my passion for technology uh, with my core principles, uh, social justice and pacifism and ending war, you know, things that obviously are impossible to do, but uh, things that I aspire to. You know? <laughs> And, and so Bitcoin was this perfect combination of, a, of an incredibly disruptive technology that also had within it the ability to empower people. Um, and so uh, that started my journey in Bitcoin. I uh, switched to doing full-time Bitcoin about a year and a half ago. Um, I founded a company that did a few startups to provide various community services, uh, not for profit, but to, to build a community. And I started getting involved in media and trying to use uh, my skills and my expertise to, to, to promote Bitcoin as much as I can. Um, at the moment, I'm going at, to conferences all around the world to talk about Bitcoin. And one of the things I'm doing this year is focusing primarily on the developing world. And I'm going to talk a bit about that and why it's so important. So, uh, Bitcoin isn't money. Uh, money is just the first application on the Bitcoin network. Uh, unfortunately, the Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin system, the Bitcoin invention, and the Bitcoin currency all have the same name, which can be confusing. So when people first experience this, they think that Bitcoin is a currency because they see the first app. And that's a bit like assuming in 1991 that the internet is an email network. Right? Uh, yes, it is the major killer app. It is one of the things that's going to make Bitcoin succeed. But Bitcoin success doesn't depend on the currency, just like the internet success and the impact it had on the world didn't depend on email. In fact, nowadays, email is what my dad uses, right? Uh, and and you know, I don't really. I use Twitter instead. But um, so something similar is happening in Bitcoin because currency is just the first application on this platform, on this network. So let's talk a bit about the invention. What did Satoshi Nakamoto achieve? Uh, with the invention of Bitcoin. Uh, back in 1975, uh, computer scientists in the distributed systems environment um, first articulated a problem called the Byzantine General's problem, which is a problem of achieving consensus over an insecure network, a network where you don't have the ability to send messages without those being intercepted. And they described this problem using a metaphor of a number of Byzantine generals, generals who have amassed armies to conquer a city. And you have four generals arrayed around this city. And they want to coordinate 
and decide on when to attack the city all together. But the problem is, in order for them to send messages from one general to the other, they have to get their runners to go through the city. And you know, their runners are not making it through the city. And even if they do, they don't know if the message that gets to the other side is really the message from the other general. And so this problem was expressed to describe this, because in distributed systems, when you have a network, when you have computer systems communicating over a network, achieving consensus is something very difficult to do. Uh, being able to agree on what the state of the network is and, and how it operates is something very difficult, especially if you have active adversaries in the system who are trying to corrupt that decision, right? like the city that doesn't want to be invaded. Um, the problem was expressed in 1975, and it didn't have any good solutions. It had some optimizations, but no good solutions. And so Satoshi Nakamoto, when he first expressed this, didn't really talk about the Byzantine general's problem. But immediately the people who read his paper understood that this might be related to this. And their reaction was absolutely predictable. They laughed at it. Uh, because obviously you can't just solve the Byzantine general's problem. It's gone unsolved for 35 years. Who does this guy think he is? So um, they laughed at him. And uh, five years later, we know it works. Uh, it may not be perfect. It's not a uh, perfect solution to the problem, but it works, and it works well enough. And there's this very interesting thing that happens when you have a technology that's good enough that achieves network scale and is able to be distributed over a large network, where good enough suddenly becomes perfect. Not because it is perfect, but because it enables the kind of innovation that makes it sticky, that starts accelerating the network effect. Network effect is a term coined by Bob Metcalf in 1984. He's the inventor of Ethernet. And he identified that on networks, a very interesting thing happens. When you have two people communicating and a third person is added to that network, that person not only adds their own value to the network, but they also increase the value of the other two people, because they now have one more person to talk to. Right? So if you have an email system with two recipients, and you add a third recipient, suddenly everyone on the network now has an extra recipient, which accelerates the adoption of the technology. This network effect has been seen in a number of different technologies, especially communication technologies. And Bitcoin is one of the strongest network effects ever seen. Why? Because it's money. <laughs> it's network effect, but with actual value. So when Bob Metcalf said the value of the network increases exponentially with the addition of each node, he was using the term value metaphorically. In Bitcoin, there's nothing metaphorical about it. It absolutely is the literal value of the network can increase exponentially. And that's why we see this logarithmic curve in the adoption, in the price, in the number of nodes, in the number of users, in the number of wallets, in every aspect of the Bitcoin system is accelerating at an exponential rate. We don't do one, two, three. We do one ten, a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand. So on those rates of deployment and adoption, things become very different. And it, it, it acquires a power uh, that is uh, far beyond the power of each individual node. There's another effect that occurs within Bitcoin, which is the issue of emergent complexity. Uh, the fact that you can have very, very simple rules on individual nodes. And based on those rules, the network as a whole starts exhibiting very complex behavior. One of the best metaphors I like to use to explain that is the leaf cutter ant, uh, which is an, uh, an ant. Right? They cut leaves. And, uh, the interesting thing about these ants is that on an individual basis, an ant is a very simple organism. It works by very simple rules. You can actually simulate you know, all 200 neurons in, a, in an ant's brain on a computer and have a virtual ant that works like the real ant. You put that in an environment with chemical pheromones in a real jungle, and suddenly you have an emergent colony that exhibits behavior and intelligence far beyond that of each individual node. So, for example, the leafcutter ant is the only known insect species that has domesticated another insect species and farms them as cattle. Uh, leafcutter ants don't eat the leaves. They ferment them with an enzyme, and then they feed them to aphids, and then they eat the aphid larvae. So this is an incredibly complex behavior, farming, exhibited by an insect colony, in which none of the individuals in the colony actually have that behavior in them. Bitcoin is exactly like that. It's a system that exhibits complex behavior as the sum 
that complex behavior emerges from the collaboration of thousands of nodes, all executing very, very simple rules. And that's one of the best ways in nature to organize decentralized systems. Nature doesn't do hierarchical systems. Humans do hierarchical systems. And usually humans do hierarchical systems to solve problems of scale. All of the hierarchical systems we have in our uh, society, the institutions of democracy and corporations, of nation states, of currencies as we know them today, are based on hierarchical systems because in the 17th century, you couldn't get a message across the continent. So you needed representatives to gather to express the will of the constituents. Bitcoin is simply an, uh, an evolution of that concept. It is taking the concept of a decentralized system that has emergent behavior and applying it to currency, or more specifically, to a distributed asset ledger, which we'll get into in a second. So, What's interesting about this is that decentralized systems are more effective at scale, at large scale, than any hierarchical system can ever be. And they also solve one of the main problems of hierarchical systems, which is that when you have a hierarchy that's organized by people and institutions, the people who arise to the top of those hierarchies become corrupted and co-opted, and they gradually um, subvert the purpose of the hierarchical system to serve their own needs. And this repeats in every political system and in every social system we have, which is as soon as you rise to the top, you pull up the ladder so you can make sure that none of the rabble uh, get up there with you, right? And you can take full advantage of your nice high position. Um, hierarchical systems don't scale, and they don't deliver equality for very long because they get co-opted. Decentralized systems scale, and as long as the rules that they are based on continue to operate, they continue to deliver the primary goal, which is leveling the field leveling the playing field for all participants. One of the things that I believe is that if you have the ability to put a decentralized system next to a hierarchical system, and people have a choice between the two, the decentralized system will always deliver more value to every node in the network than the hierarchical system. And it will do it with better accountability, with better predictability, with less uncertainty, with less risk, and it's much harder to corrupt and co-opt. And now we're doing it to money for the first time in history. <laughs> That's a very big deal. Uh, as you can see, I get emotional about this. <laughs> so it's hard to see from the perspective of Western nations why this is important, because here in North America, we have the world's reserve currency. And it's a really good, stable currency. I mean, we might disagree, and I know there's a lot of libertarians and Austrian economists and people like that who will say, you know, the dollar sucks. Yes, it sucks. It sucks 193 times less than the other 193 currencies, though. <laughs> right? So if you were to put a hierarchy of currencies and you have the dollar up here, and down here is the Zimbabwe dollar, right? And you want to talk to a Zimbabwean about how they feel about their currency. Uh, there's this great picture on the internet of a stack of hundred trillion dollars Zimbabwe bills. And that stack is used to buy a cup of coffee. So uh, that Zimbabwe dollar has been eroded to the point where it is less valuable than goat shit. And the reason for that is because you can actually burn goat shit better. Um, so you can use it for heating and cooking and things like that, whereas the Zimbabwe dollar doesn't burn very well. Um, it literally becomes far less valuable than the paper it's printed on. So when we ask ourselves, why does Bitcoin matter in North America? The answer is, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter as much. It matters far more in every other place in the world. We have it easy here. We have a currency that allows us, to a certain extent, to have predictability, to be able to invest in the future. You go to Argentina, the currency is devaluing at 30% a year. Right? Now, imagine you're a parent, and you're trying to plan for your, the, the future of your children, and you have your own personal wealth depreciating 30% a year, the education of your children is, is, is disappearing in front of your eyes. Their future is being stolen from you by a central bank, right in front of your eyes. And for these people, Bitcoin is now a choice that allows them to achieve economic independence. Now, we would love to have economic independence here, because our financial system is fucked up and corrupt. and We all know that. But compared to the rest of the world, it's, you know, it's easy. It's great. 
So one of the things I talk about a lot is the fact that Bitcoin is all about the other six billion. And I want to talk a bit about that and explain what I mean. In the world at the moment, the World Bank estimates that there are about three billion people who have no bank accounts. Um, but that is a very narrow measure. They are counting only the working adults, none of their families. Right? And they are counting only people who don't have a bank account at all, who live in an entirely cash-based society. But the reality is there is a whole spectrum between the two extremes. There are about a billion people in this world, mostly in Western societies, in North America, in Western Europe, and in the upper echelons of the social classes in these countries, who have the ability not only to have bank accounts, but to have ample access to credit and large pools of liquidity, so they can start businesses, so they can borrow, so they can buy cars, so they can uh, buy houses on mortgages. They have access to international finance. They can transfer money to other countries with very few currency controls. Right? And they can do international trade with this money, essentially working above governments and above nation states in a state of complete economic freedom. And that is a billion people. And then there's the other six billion. And they may have bank accounts, but those bank accounts have currency controls. They don't have the ability to do international trade. They're stuck in a specific currency that's controlled by a central bank that uses inflation as a means to steal from the people. Essentially, inflation becomes a form of taxation, right? Because if your currency is depreciating 30 percent a year, that means that that money is going somewhere. And where it's going is in the new money that's being printed by the central bank, usually to buy guns and tanks and bombs, which is why I'm in Bitcoin. So one of the reasons I'm interested in Bitcoin is because in the state of human affairs, if you ask a nation to divest its wealth in order to fund war, the only way you can do that is by stealing, is by lying, is by cheating. If you ask for the consent of the governed, to fund war, they will say no. They would rather fund education, health care, social welfare, development, things here, not abroad. And that applies here as it applies in any country in the world. So one of the things that happens when you have a currency that is not subject to central bank control is that you achieve separation of money and state. You take away the power of state to use money as a, as a tool of power, as a means of control, and as a means not only of control, but as a means of enrichment. And money has been a means of control for governments for centuries. Until now, each government was able to apply control through money, not only by issuing it and then taxing in that money, but also by controlling the flows of money in and out of the country. So Bitcoin is not the 194th currency. Bitcoin is the first international currency. Bitcoin is the first algorithmic currency. Bitcoin is the first currency that is not controlled by governments, is not controlled by corporations, is not controlled by banks. It's controlled by mathematics. And we can trust mathematics because we can predict exactly what's going to happen on the Bitcoin network. In the next 10 minutes, 25 Bitcoin will be created. Not 26, not 24. In 2016, that will change to 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes. I know this. How do I know this? I can read the source code. I can look at the source codes and I can know exactly how it's going to work. And again, we've never done this before. So Bitcoin offers for the first time on a global basis the opportunity for people to make a choice to make a choice to uh, use a currency that is outside of the control of hierarchical institutions that have become corrupted everywhere. And that's why I think Bitcoin is much more than just a currency. Let's talk a bit about the technology. Within Bitcoin, there is a common distributed asset ledger, the blockchain. What that is, is like a big book that contains all of the transactions that have happened on the network. And that distributed asset ledger allows the entire network to arrive at consensus as to what the current ownership of Bitcoin is. I like to think of it a bit like the network layer protocol, like internet protocol, IPv4. It provides a neutral and transparent way for transferring value from one owner to another owner in a way that is accepted by everyone in the network. Very importantly, 
the only two participants in a Bitcoin transaction are the sender and the recipient. There is no third party. There is no counterparty. In finance, that has some very important implications. A lot of the structures we have in finance around fraud prevention, the overheads, the fees, the charges, all of those things have to do with managing counterparty risk. When you use a credit card, part of the fee you're paying, the biggest part of the fee, is for fraud prevention and for the risk of chargeback that you introduce through the counterparty to the merchant. The merchant doesn't know that they're going to get their money. They get a promise that maybe Visa might give them the money. And this applies across the entire financial system. Our financial system is riddled with counterparties, because that's the legal solution to solving counterparty risk. Bitcoin, for the first time, enables financial transactions that have no counterparties, where it is entirely peer-to-peer, -peer, so one sender can send to one recipient. Once you encode that transaction in the blockchain, that is irrevocably redeemable. What do I mean by irrevocably redeemable? It means that as long as you can produce the necessary encumbrance, the necessary proof that you own the keys, you can redeem that transaction, and no one can stop you. And in fact, the fact that it's on the blockchain has immediately made that transaction redeemable by the owner. Done. And from that moment on, there is no risk that you cannot redeem that transaction, as long as the network continues to exist. Bitcoin also, for the first time, converts money or asset ownership into a content type. A Bitcoin transaction is about 350 bytes of information. I can write it in hex on a napkin. I can hand it to someone to type in a computer in Kuala Lumpur, and when it hits the blockchain, I have executed that transaction. I could transmit it over shortwave radio to a listening station in burst mode, and no one can stop me from doing it. You cannot stop money that is information. Because in order to stop money that is information, you have to shut down every means of information transfer on the planet. And you can't do that anymore. So stopping Bitcoin actually involves shutting down the internet. As of a couple of months ago, some groups are now working to introduce a fully indexed blockchain node on a satellite. So you can put a Bitcoin node in space. Good luck shutting that down. The Bitcoin network only requires two nodes to be communicating the blockchain among each other and mining, and it survives. So you would have to eradicate it everywhere simultaneously and ensure it never comes back. There's one other form of species on our planet that operates like that, and it's a virus. And uh, we're not very good at eradicating those either. So when I hear about the idea that governments will stomp on Bitcoin and shut it down, I find that highly amusing. Because it's very similar to the idea that governments can now stop the internet. They can't. And Bitcoin is just an internet application and can be stopped even less. The biggest difference? There's an economic incentive, a ten billion dollar economic incentive from all of us who are invested in the Bitcoin network to ensure that that never happens. So I truly believe that Bitcoin is absolutely unstoppable from external perspectives today. Now that doesn't mean that Bitcoin will survive. It means that if we fuck it up, it will fail from the inside. There are certain failure modes that Bitcoin could exhibit today. Probably the most serious is a bug that allows someone to subvert the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm in a way that's not noticed for a long time. And if that's done effectively, then you wouldn't know who owns what, and you wouldn't be able to make sure that a transaction was executed by the actual holder of the keys. If there was a fundamental bug in the way ECDSA was implemented on Bitcoin, that could crash Bitcoin. Then what happens? The very next morning, we start again with Bitcoin 2, and we implement a better digital signature algorithm. And all of us get a chance to be back on the system, on the ground level. <laughs> we can now mine on CPUs again. <laughs> Difficulty one. <laughs> um, and if you have already understood what Bitcoin can do, and you've bought into this idea, you'd want to be on Bitcoin too. 
So one of the things I talk about, which I think is really important to understand, is that Bitcoin the network, and Bitcoin the invention of cryptocurrency, the invention of a distributed asset ledger based on proof-of-work consensus, will survive Bitcoin the currency. If Bitcoin the currency goes away tomorrow, the invention has not been uninvented. It could set us back by a couple of years. We're going to have a terrible job doing all of our public relations and branding again. Right? It's going to lose a lot of credibility, but in a few years we're going to boot it again. And we've got all the time in the world because this is history-making technology that has been invented, has happened, and will change the world. So the reason I'm excited about Bitcoin is because of all of the other applications that can also be built on top of the currency. Already we're seeing the emergence of additional layers. I talked about how Bitcoin, the blockchain, is a network layer that allows you to do transfer of assets from sender to recipient. But within that, there's a transaction scripting language. If you look at how a transaction is executed, when Alice pays Bob one Bitcoin, that's actually included in a transaction script that uses a fourth-like stack-based language, reverse Polish notation. If you're into computer science, you'll know what I mean. What that means is that language is capable of expressing much more complex transactions, including multi-signature transactions, but even other conditions that have nothing to do with currency or signatures. You can do trusts, you can do escrows, you can do time locks. You can do infinite complexity within that. And already, based on that transaction scripting language, which I think is equivalent to TCP on the internet, we're now seeing the emergence of higher level protocols. Colored coins, Mastercoin, NXT, Ethereum, and a whole bunch of others that are coming along right now. 2014 will be the year of the next layers. We're already moving the innovation up a layer. And these layers represent the HTTP of Bitcoin. They represent the ability to start to innovate and layer applications on top of the core transport to enable other types of assets to be exchanged. For example, stock certificates that are redeemable by the bearer completely anonymously, fully transferable, that allow the bearer of that stock certificate to both vote in terms of a board shareholder election, as well as receive direct dividends to that coin. So we can reinvent corporate management and governance on a global distributed corporation basis. You may hear people talk about distributed autonomous corporations. The idea of having a structure that allows people to associate in business without the legal component and without the hierarchy of the board of directors, replacing both of those with an algorithm. Bitcoin represents the first step, because what we've done is we've replaced central banking, the issuance and minting of new currency, by an algorithm. But at its core, it allows us to do this with all other things that are hierarchical and replace those with algorithms. There are already coins that can do income redistribution based on proof of stake. So that's taxation, social welfare, and um, basic income guarantees implemented as an algorithm. The decentralized nature of Bitcoin allows us to implement metapolitics. Politics is an algorithm, governance as a predictable algorithm. And so it's not just disrupting money. Money is just the first step. It's going to fundamentally disrupt corporations. It's going to fundamentally disrupt nation states. Because it allows those forms of organizations to be redesigned on a decentralized principle that removes the levers of control that historically have been grabbed by the first adopters and manipulated to prevent others from using them. So equitable solutions can be encoded in an algorithm in a way that cannot be corrupted. Some of the applications that come out of uh, the Bitcoin invention are things like distributed, fair, provable elections. You can use a pseudo currency to vote on a global basis. So the hierarchical concept of representative democracy, where you have no direct access to the decision making, itself can be disrupted by immediate and direct decision making on a global basis. You can implement global lotteries, you can implement crowdfunding, global stock markets, 
where a digital autonomous corporation registered nowhere can fundraise from shareholders from the entire globe and then implement its corporate strategy and respond to the demands of those shareholders without any regulation. And the shareholders can then execute their decisions by voting with their coin and getting dividends back with their coin. You can implement global lotteries. You can implement bond systems. So we start by disrupting the core concept of currency. And we do that by reinventing the central bank as an algorithm. We replace the Fed with a hundred lines of Python code. <laughs> but that's only the beginning. 